Hello, welcome to today's program, Water Security Through Transboundary Cooperation, examples from the United States, Canada, and Mexico. My name is Julian Kachanoff. Uh, I'm the water team lead here at the US Department of State. We're excited to have you join today's discussion. Today's webinar is the third in an ongoing series co-hosted with the State Department's Bureau of Global Public Affairs. Our goal is to use these webinars to facilitate conversations surrounding some of the most important water issues facing our planet. Our first webinar was earlier this year on the issue of water reuse in South and Central Asia. If you're interested in watching a recording of that event, uh, you can find it at the interactive.gov link in the chat box. Our second webinar was in July and focused on the issues of drought and salinity in the Mekong Delta. If you're interested in watching a recording of that event, there's a link in the chat box as well. Throughout the program, please share your, your comments and questions in the chat box. We look forward to your questions and invite you to reach out to our team anytime if you'd like a follow-on conversation. We are sharing our office email in the chat. Before I begin, a disclaimer. Uh, our fantastic invited guests will be speaking for themselves and the views they express during this webinar are their own. Their remarks or presentations do not reflect the official views of the US government. A quick word about today's topic. The United States has a long history of working with its neighbors on the issue of water. We're here today to share some examples of how the United States, Canada, and Mexico have worked together to address water challenges and have achieved successes for shared water management. Cooperation between the United States and Canada traces back to 1909 with the Boundary Waters Treaty and the establishment of the International Joint Commission, or IJC. The IJC manages a wide range of transboundary issues, including uh, water levels and flows, uh, water and air quality, and stakeholder engagement. We are very excited to hear from one of the Canadian commissioners, Marilyn Farr, today. Welcome, Marilyn. To the South, the United States has been working with Mexico since at least 1889 with the establishment of the Binational International Boundary and Water Commission, or IBWC. We're excited to hear from Ann Castle, currently a senior fellow from the University of Colorado today. Go Buffaloes. From her perspective as a practitioner, both in and outside of government, and will share her views on stakeholder engagement and water management in the Colorado River Basin. These treaties and commissions and the water that they govern affect millions of people, thousands of communities, tribal nations, and ecosystems every day. Finally, we're excited to hear from Gilbert Trejo from, the El Paso, from El Paso Water on how his community has worked with many other stakeholders to provide water access. Now, I would like to welcome our moderator for today, Melissa Meeker. Melissa is the CEO of the Water Tower. Uh, Melissa has over 25 years of experience in water resources management with an emphasis on alternative water supply development and research workforce development, and public engagement. Melissa previously served as the CEO of the Water Environment and Reuse Foundation and was instrumental in the merger of three water-related research foundations. She also served as Executive Director of the South Florida Water Management District and Deputy Secretary of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. We're excited to have her join this conversation. Welcome, Melissa. Uh, I'll now turn over the conversation over to you. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure to, uh, to be here today. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, it doesn't matter where you are, along a river, a lake, or an aquifer, we know that water is precious and that it, it is critical to society, to our well being, to our food, our economy, and frankly, our lives, everything. Climate change, population growth, and the lack of appreciation of this precious resource are just a few of the reasons that water continues to be stressed in the US and surrounding countries and around the world. We have seen, however, some great efforts on collaboration and partnership that are improving the state of and management of our water resources. There is certainly more focus on resilient and diverse water supplies from source water protection to wastewater and stormwater reuse. 
And many of these examples have a unique focus on transboundary and indigenous communities. And that's really why I'm excited to moderate this expert panel and hear where the conversation goes this afternoon. Our format is to have each of our three panelists present on their perspectives and experiences for approximately 12 minutes. These presentations will provide you with some background and begin to set the stage for the panel discussion with specific case studies. We'll be saving the questions until all the panelists have finished, but I encourage you to submit your questions as they come up through the chat function. So let's get to it. Our three expert panelists today for our event are Meryl Ann Fair, who is the Canadian Commissioner of the International Joint Commission. Ms. Fair is a lawyer, writer, strategist, negotiator and relationship builder who has worked extensively in and with indigenous organizations on environmental, land, water rights and governance issues. She along with the 10 First Nation Chiefs was the founding executive director of the Center for Indigenous Environmental Resources. She's leading the negotiations on some very unique agreements that I'm sure she'll touch on. She serves on a number of critical councils, holds multiple degrees in environmental economics, law and writing, She's even written a book and co-authored another specifically on water resources. Our second presenter is Anne Castle. She is a senior fellow at the Getches Wilkinson Center for Natural Resources, Energy and the Environment at the University of Colorado Law School, where she focuses on Western water issues, including the operational policies surrounding the Colorado River and the integration of water and land use planning. She is a founding member of the Water Policy Group comprised of select water sector experts who have been decision makers and trusted advisors within governments and international bodies handling complex water policy and strategy. She served as, an, as Assistant Secretary for Water and Science at the U.S. Department of Interior, where she oversaw water and science policy for DOI and had responsibility for the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation and the U.S. Geological Service. She also serves on multiple boards and advisory committees and is currently co-leading an initiative for universal access to clean and safe water on Native American reservations. Last but not least is Gilbert Trejo. Gilbert is the chief technical officer at El Paso Water and the president of the Water Reuse Association. At this critical, in this critical utility role, Gilbert oversees the technical services portfolio for the utility, including engineering, planning and development, and project and construction management. Before joining El Paso Water in 2014, he was the principal in charge with Arcadis's water division. Gilbert is a Texas licensed professional engineer and certified floodplain manager, and has his master's in water resource engineering from the University of Texas. He's also a published author on water reuse and water infrastructure. In addition to be, being president of water reuse, he is a board member of the Water Research Foundation. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Meryl Lamb. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak with you today. And I will just launch right into my PowerPoint. Oh, excuse me. I have to share my screen first. Excuse me while I pull this up. There we go. Okay, um, this is the world as the IJC looks at it. The, these are the watersheds that are transboundary watersheds that line and that trace the Canada US boundary. And so our organization is predominantly interested in these particular bodies of water, which are the transboundary bodies of water. I am calling you, excuse me, I am right now, right there at that red arrow. I'm at the confluence of the Red and the Assiniboine Rivers in the Red River Basin in the city of Winnipeg, province of Manitoba. The uh, IJC, I'm just gonna breeze through a whole bunch of just quick slides on who we are. And there's more content in my PowerPoint than I'm gonna be able to touch on, but my address, my email address is at the very end of the PowerPoint. And so if anybody wants to talk to me or email me about anything, please feel free to do so. I'd love to chat. So the commission has a lot of moving parts. We have six commissioners, three from the US and three from Canada. 
and uh, a whole number of people, mostly volunteer, that work on our boards, over 200 people, and three offices, off, um, Ottawa, um, Washington, and one focus mostly on the Great Lakes, which is in Windsor. As Julian said, we were created in 1909 by Canada and the United States, and our main goal is to prevent and uh, resolve disputes. And we deal mostly in with the two part, the two governments, with Global Affairs Canada and Department of State, but many, many other departments are implicated by our work in Canada alone. There are 22 departments that deal with water. So we have to reach out to many different stakeholders and uh, participants, interested parties, including government departments. Our two main responsibilities show up in this way. Wherever there's a structure um, that is, uh, wants to be built or is going to be built, um, we, have, we work to approve those projects. We review and approve those projects and, and give out um, an order of approval and then regulate that project over time. The other way that we do our work is through research and recommendations through things called references, which I will explain in one moment. So this idea of references is governments, the, the two parties, Canada and the US, will refer to us a question or an issue that they would like us to explore. And we then conduct research and review and make recommendations to them, which they are not bound to accept and they consider and accept some and not necessarily others, but that's, that's our job. We also have a convening and facilitating um, responsibility where we try to bring people together to collaborate and reach dialogue. We have a more informal alerting function. When you think of trying to prevent problems, you've got to think long-term and see things on the horizon. And so we have an informal alerting function and we have 18 boards that help us do our work. Each one that has its own specific mandate, 18 right now. Seven of them are control boards. You can see where there's numbers. Those are boards that regulate projects. They regulate dams and diversions and things like that. And they have orders that they grant in order for that to happen. And they review those on an ongoing basis. We also have an, another 11 boards. Some of them are specific to the Great Lakes, two of them. We have two that are cross-cutting that think about an issue across all of our watersheds, like the Health Advisory Board, Health Professionals Advisory Board. And then we have right now three study boards. Two of them have just wrapped up. And we have four what are called watershed boards, and I will explain those in a moment. I was asked predominantly to talk about what are some of the key needs that our organization would have um, to really uh, meet the challenges that we see coming in the complexity of the water world, to actually engage in the kind of management and stewardship that, that we could within our mandate. I picked two issues. We have so many that I could have put on this list. I picked two big ones, building resilience as a result of climate change and indigenous engagement. And I'll just give a little bit of um, content to both of those, but there, I, really seriously, there are so many other issues that we're facing. Here's the big issue regarding climate. We all know um, that water is actually a nexus issue. When the Boundary Waters Treaty was created in 1909, it was mostly about water quality and quantity it wasn't about all of these interconnected issues of habitat and ecosystems and species and groundwater and pollution. And it, I mean, it was a little bit about pollution, but the pollution back then was just less complex. So we have a nexus issue with many, many departments and many issues and our mandate is originally focused on water quality and quantity. So we're constantly pushing that issue. Climate is changing faster than the science that we rely on is changing. Prediction, of flood events, droughts, is based on 100 years of science. And that science is not that valid any longer for predicting the future. It's called the lack of stationarity. We were, were based on a model of consensus. The commissioners operate by consensus, as do the boards. Consensus is much more difficult when the issues are very complex. And the pressures that come from climate change seem to be pushing people into a positional stance rather than interest-based stance. We work very hard through these issues, but they're getting harder and harder to work through. And also the interests back in 1909 were represented by people that were more uniform 
I'm only the third in, uh, woman since 1909 on the IJC. And the American co-chair, Jane Corwin, is the fourth or third and fourth, depending on how you look at it. And, and so we're just starting to get a broader range of interests that are actually being considered. And also IJC, we are advisors and recommenders. We're not builders. We're not the doers. The governments are the doers. We're not a government. So how we connect with local and state governments on these very, and indigenous governments on these very complex issues is quite, um, quite a challenge. We have one tool that is really promising for meeting this challenge. It's called the International Watershed Initiative. It's been in operation for a while and it's been quite successful. It basically says we need to look at things from an ecosystem perspective. Good decisions at the border mean that we've got to look broader than the border. We're not going into those regions to make decisions, but we're making good decisions at the border based on more information and more partnerships. And so we, the IWI has a number of principles that guide it. I've listed them there. The really critical ones in my view are, as I said, an ecosystem approach, an adaptive management perspective, and very inclusive board representation. We have four of them. You can see the numbers at the bottom there. Those are the four watershed boards that we have right now. Two of them are permanent boards and two of them are still in a pilot stage, meaning they're testing it out. The challenge that we have with this initiative is that it doesn't operate all along the border. It's just in four regions. It has a huge opportunity to be an, an, an excellent mechanism everywhere to help us deal with climate change, but it's not there yet. So the second issue uh, as an ongoing challenge and a need is the role of indigenous peoples in the work of the IJC. The Boundary Waters Treaty says we have to consult and engage with everybody who has an interest and we do that. Um, we know that indigenous people have interests um, that is important for our work to seek out and they also have really important knowledge that can help us make better decisions so that the decisions we make don't impact them or impact them as minimally as possible. Our more current agreements like the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that IJC is a part of specifically references indigenous nations, tribes, First Nations and Métis. They do things like say we need to coordinate among all the parties and other governments including indigenous governments. We need to ensure consistent water quality standards among all regulatory agencies and other governments, which would include Indigenous governments. But how to do that is a challenge. We're getting there somewhat. For the first time in IJC's, IJC's history, we have an Indigenous commissioner, Dr. Henry Lickers, who's Haudenosaunee and has a long history of working with the IJC. We have a number of representatives, Indigenous representatives on our boards, but we're not consistent enough. We have the six commissioners have a consensus position that engagement with Indigenous people is critical and that we are striving to make it consistent and much deeper and that we also want to include of course Indigenous knowledge to make better decisions. Our ongoing challenges are Indigenous governments are not signatory to the Boundary Waters Treaty but they have rights and their governments. Sometimes these water rights are not clearly defined along the Canada US border, but they exist. And so we're trying to navigate, how do you work with them as governments when most of those relationships are with the domestic governments, but those are the questions that matter to the indigenous nations. How do we, what's our role in that? The second is indigenous governments are frequently community level governments, but they have participation as a broader nation. How do we work with them to respect their governance structures at the local level and at the higher level because there's many nations and many communities. If we wanted to create a transboundary collaborative water agenda, how could we do that and what would that look like? And finally, how can we find more opportunities for indigenous knowledge systems to work together with us to make better decisions? Those are our key challenges. As I said, they're by no means all of our challenges, but I provide them to you as food for thought and hopefully to generate a conversation today. Thank you. Excellent. There's her address if you wanted to follow up directly, but again, if you have a question, please put it in the chat function. Um, Anne, let's turn it over to you. Thank you. 
Thanks, Melissa, and hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. I am going to talk today about the relationship between the US and Mexico in managing the Colorado River system. I'm going to talk about some of the ups and downs, uh, the controversies and the successes, and where we're heading into the future. So first we start with a map. Um, this is a map of the entire Colorado River system. It's uh, about 1,500 miles from headwaters to the delta. You can see on this map that it includes seven U.S. states in the western part of the U.S. and two states in northwestern Mexico. And we're going to focus on just the border portion of the Colorado River Basin today. And I'll show you a larger scale map of that. Um, so this is the Colorado River coming down from the north in the US and ultimately emptying into the Sea of Cortez or the Gulf of California. Um, a couple of things to notice on this map because we'll come back to them in other pictures and stories. Um, first of all, Morelos Dam, which is a dam located in Mexico. It's the last dam on the river. And it's a diversion dam. It doesn't store water, it just funnels water into an irrigation system in Mexico that serves this area here called the Mexicali Valley. Um, the river comes down forming the boundary between the US and Mexico for a short reach. This is about 25 miles or 40 kilometers. Um, and it comes very close to the city of San Luis Rio Colorado which is a Mexican city in the state of Sonora, about 200,000 people. It's actually the largest city in population terms in the entire Colorado River Basin that's located right on the river. Um, and then the river keeps going all the way down south into the Sea of Cortez. The relationship between the US and Mexico on the Colorado River is governed by a treaty that was entered into in 1944. And it deals primarily with a delivery requirement. It requires the US to deliver 1.5 million acre feet to Mexico every year through the river channel. That translates to uh, about 1,850 gigaliters um, for those of you who are working in the metric system. Um, it has a provision that says that that guaranteed amount, that 1.5 million acre feet, can be reduced in the event of extraordinary drought. But extraordinary drought is not defined in the treaty, and that's been a source of anxiety on both sides of the border for a number of years. There's no water quality requirement in the treaty at all. But water quality became a problem um, not too long after the treaty was entered into, in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, the water was becoming increasingly saline that was delivered to Mexico in the river. And that was primarily because of increased agricultural use in the US where the runoff was becoming more and more saline. It's a problem in the US as well. Um, but it was damaging crops in the Mexicali Valley, that irrigated area just south of the border. And so the concerns of Mexico with the salinity um, and the concerns in the US resulted in an agreement between the two countries that was entered into in 1973. And that agreement is called Minute 242. Um, it's, it's kind of a convention in connection with the 1944 treaty to call these sort of supplemental agreements that describe more detailed operations, they're called minutes. So um, there had been obviously a lot of them before 1973, but this one dealt with water quality and it guaranteed a maximum saline content of the water to be delivered to Mexico. And that maximum salinity was tied to whatever the salinity was at the last diversion in the US. So that uh, resolved the controversy and that minute is still in effect today. 
But um, you can never go long on the Colorado River without having another sort of controversy arise. And the next important one had to do with a very large irrigation canal in the US called the All-American Canal. And this aerial photo shows essentially the same region that we saw on that second map, that larger scale map that we looked at. So we see the Colorado River coming down from the north. The All-American Canal is shown here in blue. It takes off from the Colorado River, parallels the border between the US and Mexico and goes essentially um, straight west, delivering water to this big irrigation area in the Imperial Valley. Um, one thing to note on this aerial photo is all of the irrigated area in the Mexicali Valley directly south of the border, directly south of the All-American Canal. Um, and uh, this area is somewhat um, irrigated through surface diversions from the Colorado River, but also heavily dependent on um, pumping from irrigation wells. And spoiler alert, the groundwater gradient goes from north to south um, from across the border into the Mexicali Valley. This is what the All-American Canal looks like on the ground. Um, obviously really dry desert, lots of sandy soil. And you can imagine the kind of seepage that you get from uh, a dirt canal of this size with this kind of water. And in fact, it was estimated that the All-American Canal was losing about 100,000 acre feet of water per year to seepage. That's 125 gigaliters, lots and lots of water. Um, and the US farmers um, being water short as most farmers usually are, uh, began to talk about lining the canal to recover some of that or most of the water that was lost to seepage. Well, that set off serious concerns in Mexico because that seepage from the All-American Canal is one of the primary sources of recharge to the groundwater aquifer that supplies the irrigation wells in the Mexicali Valley. So um, there was strenuous objection from Mexico to the proposed lining project. And this controversy played out over many years, starting in the late 1980s, all the way up into the 2000s. Eventually a lawsuit was filed by water interests in Mexico in US courts. That was proceeding badly um, uh, from the standpoint of the Mexican interests. And eventually the US Congress intervened and authorized the lining of the All-American Canal without any further environmental review. So the lining project actually started in 2007 and was completed in 2009 over Mexico's objection. And it did have the impact that um, the, the Mexican water interests were concerned about, that is um, diminishing the recharge to the aquifer in the Mexicali Valley and as a result, less water being available for irrigation. So, that set off an a antagonistic relationship between the two countries. Um, but then, as sometimes happens, nature intervened to change up the deal. And in 2010, shortly after the completion of the lining of the All American Canal, on Easter Sunday, there was a big earthquake in Baja, California, just south of the border. Um, 7.2 magnitude, it devastated the irrigation infrastructure in the valley. And you can see here this picture of a broken canal, water going everywhere. Well, it, it made it um, so that the Mexican states were unable to take their guaranteed delivery of water from the US because the irrigation infrastructure just wasn't uh, there to be able to receive it and distribute it. So the Mexican government asked the US if it could defer delivery 
of, the, of a portion of the 1.5 million acre feet that they were due and store that deferred water in US reservoirs because there aren't any storage reservoirs in the Colorado River Basin in Mexico. And the US agreed. And that interaction really changed up what had been the acrimony as a result of the All-American Canal. And it allowed entry into new agreements between the US and Mexico, new minutes. Um, they're numbered here on the slide. The first one was the one that allowed Mexico to store that deferred water in US reservoirs and, and to allow that going forward. It, um, these agreements provided for joint infrastructure projects between the two countries, provided for a one-time environmental pulse flow, and I'm gonna talk some more about that. Um, and Mexico also agreed to reduce deliveries um, that it would get through the system during times of very dry conditions. Um, and we'll talk more about that during the panel discussion. But I wanna talk about the environmental pulse flow because it's a, it's a wonderful story to tell about binational cooperation. Um, and again, we have to look at a picture to get the, the full um, impact of what happened with this one-time pulse flow. So this is Morelos Dam. We saw that on the map um, uh, in Mexico, but um, just across the border. This is the Colorado River coming down from the north. The dam is this big um, uh, concrete structure here, and it uh, forces water into this big irrigation canal that takes off to the west, to the left, um, and that's feeding a, a lot of acreage of irrigation systems in um, Baja California. But what happens to the river? Well, there's not much river left after Morelos Dam and uh, it basically takes all the water in the river and the Colorado River after Morelos is just this tiny little thread um, that you can see in the lower right. Um, so basically the river is dry after Morelos Dam, all 75 miles down to the Sea of Cortez. But that all changed um, during the environmental pulse flow in 2014. This is the same place. So this is Morelos Dam, irrigation canal off to the left, river coming down, but there was so much water that it just went around the dam. And now we have a real river again. This is a before and after picture right close to that town of San Luis Rio, Colorado. Um, these photos were taken a week apart. Um, this upper photo is what the river usually looks like, totally dry river channel. You can um, get the scale by looking at this person over here on the left. And one week later, it was a river again. Um, so that's what it was 25 miles down, 40 kilometers down. Um, from the border and this, the water is being released in a slug from US reservoirs. That's how the pulse flow was created. The idea was to see if we could get water to uh, flow to the sea once again, because it had done do that very often. And we really didn't know if that was gonna happen. This was um, a aerial photo taken about seven weeks after the beginning of the pulse flow. You can see the river coming down from the north. The brown is the tidal plain of the Sea of Cortez coming up from the south, almost there. And three days later, the river and the sea were connected once again. Um, so it was, it was a great event. It was important um, symbolically because the river uh, it did connect to the sea as it had um, for millennia, but, but not recently. Um, and it was important politically as a demonstration of the binational cooperation between the two countries. But one of the most important lessons from this experiment was the reaction of communities along the river. This is a picture of that same city, San Luis, Rio, Colorado. 
Um, and this is a city that was was established on the river. It was founded because the river was there. It was named after the river. And then the river went away. But when the river came back, even though it was only temporary, the community responded and people came out. They were playing in the river. Kids brought their water toys. Pets were splashing in the river. Circus rides came out. There were vendors everywhere. There were bands, people were dancing on the beach, they were dancing in the river. It was an amazing and, and incredibly moving event. And, and I tell that story and, and we'll talk more later about the, the sort of um, more traditional water management uh, cooperation between the two countries. But I think it's important to remember and celebrate this human connection. Thank you, Anne. Okay, Gilbert, you are a third presenter. Let's go. All right, let me share my screen as well. I think I got it there. Presentation only, you guys see that? All right, well, it's, I've got a tough job following Anne and Merrill Ann here. They, those are two fantastic presentations. Um, my presentation is gonna focus on the community of El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. Um, and how water impacts both of these communities. Uh, first off, El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, a, a lot of folks not familiar with the area think El Paso is a small community. They think of McAllen, they think of Laredo, when in reality, uh, this metroplex is actually two and a half million uh, people strong. Uh, you have 1.4 million people in Juarez and you have another 830,000 people in El Paso County and together we form a community that very much works together and both communities growing strong and with that comes water challenges. Um, again, just some more fun facts. So this North American border plex uh, is one of the 10 largest manufacturing hubs in all of North America. Uh, the region's success stems from our ability to offer manufacturing companies the ability to engage in production sharing. So production sharing enables companies to produce a component, sub-assembly, and finished products uh, by locating production facilities in close proximity to each other. So both communities feed off each other uh, with what you can do in Juarez and then uh, El Paso providing uh, some of the workforce. Juarez provides workforce back to El Paso and it just works very seamlessly. You know, there's big companies, some of these Fortune 500 companies that are located here in this in this border plex and take advantage of, of, of this community. So you have Boeing, you know, Lexmark, Foxconn, you know, these are important manufacturing uh, companies that provide a lot of the components uh, that are used by companies like, like Apple in the, in the case of Foxconn. Another big uh, economic driver here in this region is Fort Bliss. So Fort Bliss is a military installation um, that is a huge, that is very important to El Paso economy. You know, between 2005 and 2012, the installation grew from 10,000 soldiers to 34,000 soldiers as a result of realignment of a realignment initiative. So Fort Bliss currently employs over 40,000 El Pasoans. It's extremely important to our community. Uh, above all, Fort Bliss also serves and supports all the branches of the military. Um, last, last year's economic impact estimated Fort Bliss's uh, gross domestic product to be 14.2 billion, which is a big deal here for, for our community. And one out of every five people in El Paso are associated with Fort Bliss. One last thought on Fort Bliss. So when you think about the size of Fort Bliss, it is the largest uh, army installation that the United States has. You know, when you take Fort Bliss and White Sands Missile Range, all these um, joint military uh, bases that work together here, here in, in our region, um, you can see it stretches 183 miles north-south and you compare that to, to uh, the distance from New Hampshire all the way down to, to Connecticut. So it's a substantial, uh, military installation and the impact that it has. Um, again, more economic information. So over 63,000 jobs over the last decade have been added here in El Paso. Similarly in Ciudad Juarez, the economic uh, um, growth is matched. It's amazing how both of these communities just feed off each other uh, as El Paso grows, Juarez grows, and vice versa. Uh, trade is extremely important to this border plex economy, and you'll notice that the employment trend and the trade have similar growth patterns. Uh, Mexico is the largest uh, districts, uh, the largest uh, district in this in this uh, of import. 
uh, and export um, as a partner to the United States. And in recent years, the total trade has amounted to $75 billion. Uh, education, education is a huge part of it. So, you know, also a graduate of the University of Texas at El Paso, uh, I can tell you lots of friends, lots of folks travel from Ciudad Juarez uh, to, attend, um, to attend UTEP. Uh, UTEP in the last 30 years, you know, has grown substantially from 15,000 to 23,000 students. Um, it's been designated a research and doctoral university and been nationally recognized um, uh, on several different levels. Um, research expenditures has grown in the last um, several years from six million to over $90 million uh, a year. Health service is also very important to our community. So El Paso has a longstanding relationship with Texas Tech uh, dates back to 1973 uh, with a goal of, of this of health care for the needs of socially and culturally diverse border populations. Uh, this program has ballooned in the recent years as a result of more than a billion dollars in private and public funding that has enabled the opening of three new medical facilities uh, here in El Paso. And again, just like everything else, you know, health care, uh, several people um, or the, the community in Juarez, Mexico comes over to, to El Paso. Uh, knowledge is shared, and uh, you'll see later how all this translates to, to water as well. Again, like growing any other growing community, we also have a uh, be careful what you wish for situation here because we just recently had over $3 billion in investment in uh, major highways and arter uh, arteries here in, uh, in El Paso. So water challenges, right? So with all this, economic growth, growing population, you know, where is the water going to come from? You know, not only for us, but for Ciudad Juarez. Um, this graph just shows you um, our water demand or our water allocation, how we get our water sources now, uh, and how we plan to get it um, in 2070, 50 years from now. 50 years because the state of Texas requires us to have a 50-year water plan of how we plan to serve our communities. Uh, today, you see that uh, we have a water supply available to us of just under 160,000 acre feet. Um, that's basically an even split between the Rio Grande and the Waco Bolson aquifer. Uh, Mesilla Bolson also plays a role. And the desalination part of it is the brackish water portion of the Waco Bolson. Um, like a lot of water resources plans, the key here is diversity, having a diverse water portfolio. And that's exactly our plan to diversify our water sources even more. Um, in 2070, we'll be adding an a groundwater importation project to our portfolio, as well as advanced water purification, uh, increased uh, aquifer storage and recovery. Um, the aquifer storage will be storage of Rio Grande water, will be storage of uh, treated effluent from our wastewater plants. And again, we plan to increase the amount of desalination. The key here is the reduction in um, in reliance on our groundwater. You can see the slices of pie there for the Mesilla Bolson and the Waco Bolson um, to be reduced um, as the further we get out in, in, in the future. So the Waco Bolson aquifer is an important aquifer for both us and Ciudad Juarez. Uh, here's, a lot, there's, here's where the Waco Bolson is relative to the state of Texas. And you know we have uh, three states and two countries that rely on groundwater. So there's two major aquifers here uh, in this region, the Waco Bolson shown in blue and the Mesilla Bolson shown uh, in yellow. Again, Waco Bolson is 1.6 million acres um, in, in area or 2,500 square, square miles. You can see the red area is approximately the metropolitan area of Ciudad Juarez and El Paso, that red circle there. So again, so both communities heavily reliant on each other economically, as I shown, but also on this precious groundwater source. Um, this map here shows all the wells that are drilled by both uh, El Paso water to serve our community. Those are the ones shown um, in, in yellow. And you see the wells shown in blue, which are the groundwater wells, uh, production wells that um, our neighboring uh, water utility has drilled to produce water for them. Um, water quality starts to become a very, is one of the bigger challenges that we face here together. Um, in blue shows the freshwater portion of the Waco Bolson, um, with blue and that cyan color. You know, this is a groundwater with TDS levels, 500 milligrams per liter or less. And then the red, the orange, 
um, and the yellow, the TDS starts to grow. So the challenge here is over pumping of the aquifer, which will then have groundwater intrusion, uh, not only into our groundwater production wells, but also into suit out flies. You know, one of the other major water sources, as I mentioned, is the Rio Grande, which flows um, from uh, southwest Colorado at uh, the, the headwaters down to Elephant Butte Reservoir. So Elephant Butte Reservoir is located 150 miles north of El Paso uh, in New Mexico. Um, the, graph, the hydrograph you see there is uh, the historical um, water flows in the Rio Grande since the Rio Grande project was completed in the early 1920s. Uh, you can see the drought cycles, you know, from the inception of uh, the Rio Grande project. Um, there's years of uh, good water availability, good water flow in the river. Uh, but in 1952, of course, that was the previous drought of record uh, on the Rio Grande. And then again, starting in about the 1980s, large amounts of water again available. Uh, but just recently in 2013, we experienced a new drought of record uh, with flows in the Rio Grande uh, being reduced to almost nothing and the water available in the in Elfin Butte was well below 5% capacity of the reservoir. So this is just another challenge uh, that we have moving forward. Again, I mentioned diversifying our water portfolio and when I speak here, I'm really going to speak about what we're doing and what uh, Juarez is doing. We're sharing the same water supplies um, because of resource advantages that we have uh, in, in the United States. We are about 15 years ahead, maybe more in other cases than where Ciudad Juarez is. So what we're doing uh, is something that Ciudad Juarez, we're kind of trailblazing the way and Ciudad Juarez really will be emulating what, what we are already doing in El Paso. So it makes it important for us to be sharing information uh, as we trailblaze and, and let them know what they're gonna be facing, uh, certainly costs and operational challenges. But you know our current water supply portfolio, you know, of course has the river, um, I talked a little bit about, about uh, water reclamation, water reuse, desalination of, of, the, of what we've already tapped into the brackish part of the Waco Bull Zone. Uh, and again, the two aquifers that we have there. I mentioned in the future, we have uh, advanced water purification, uh, aquifer storage and recovery, uh, and this groundwater importation that we plan on, on implementing in, in about 30 to 40 years. And one of the biggest challenges that, that we face, and, and certainly um, our partners in, in in Juarez are going to face is the cost. You know, frankly, there are more ways to get uh, to when you diversify your water portfolio. Um, everyone currently is using the cheapest water available. So uh, naturally, as you add water sources and you diversify your portfolio, the cost of water is going to increase. And that certainly is a challenge for us as utility as it impacts our customers. Uh, we always try and, and find federal, federal funding and advocate for, for uh, programs to help fund our, our projects, but this is a challenge that certainly um, Juarez and, and through Chihuahua and Mexico is going to have um, because they don't have um, uh, as many funding sources uh, available to them. And certainly the way they structure their, their water resources and, and uh, at the state level and at the federal level are different than, than what we do. Again, conservation is a huge part of being able to meet water demand uh, moving into the future. Uh, we've reduced our uh, GPCD in El Paso uh, from 1985 uh, from, a, from about 205 gallons per person today. Uh, today we're at 128 gallons per person per day and we have a goal ultimately to get to 118 gallons per person per day, uh, which is going to be challenging because a lot of the, the, the conservation programs that are, that are being implemented, you can say all the low hanging fruit when it comes to conservation has already been met. Uh, likewise, in Juarez, they've all, they've all, they too have been successful in reducing their GPCD um, as well, um, using a lot of the same programs that we used. Uh, there's a lot of uh, communication strategies that we shared with them for them to be able to achieve uh, similar success with a reduction in GPCD. Um, was that you can see on the graph on the right, population is going to continue to rise. Um, El Paso's planning to hit uh, over a million people by um, 2050. Um, ultimately, by, by, 20, by 2070, we'll be at 1.3 million people. So again, conservation, a big part of that. Diversification of water portfolio is a big part of that. But the biggest challenge is cost of implementation, uh, implementation of all these projects. Um, and looking ahead, you know, we have uh, implementation of our um, 
50 year water plan. Uh, we have this plan filed with the state of Texas and we plan on executing it. Uh, one of the things I do in El Paso Water is oversee the capital improvements program. Uh, one of the major projects, one of the first major projects that we have uh, already slated here uh, that is in design is the advanced water purification facility, which will take a treated effluent from our largest wastewater treatment plant. We'll treat that water uh, to drinking water standard and we'll put it into our distribution system for our customers to, to drink. So this is uh, the most advanced uh, way to reuse water directly from uh, a wastewater treatment plant uh, to our customers. But of course, with technology available nowadays, uh, with uh, education um, and familiarity that our community has with El Paso Water and the trust they have in us, we've been able to get this far with our project, but it certainly is a very important one for us and for the water industry. Um, at the same time, our continued par partnership with, with Juarez. So we have uh, data sharing, water quality information, groundwater level information, sharing of, of educational programs, like I mentioned, between us and Hamas. Hamas is the water utility in Ciudad Juarez. Um, and that's certainly a partnership that we certainly continue to foster and that we will ensure and want to play a role in the success of Juarez's water resources, again, because of how tied the two communities are to each other from an economic standpoint. And I'll go ahead and stop there, Melissa. Great, thank you so much, Gilbert. Now you each uh, brought up such fascinating terms and great stories. So I'm gonna sort of go back to the beginning, Commissioner, and start with you. You mentioned Western science and indigenous knowledge working together. I love that term, um, just you know, for that stakeholder involvement and engagement and conversation um, in order to make better decisions. Do you have any examples where that's actually worked so far? You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, I can. I can share one that um, is. It kind of brings together the whole uh, climate, indigenous knowledge, indigenous participation issue. Sort of all the issues. Um, if you think back to the slide where I showed you where I'm located, right in the middle, just to the east of that is a board, an, a watershed board. So it's one of those expanded boards that has, um, it's the Rainy River Lake of the Woods Board. And there was um, um, a, a nation in there called the Treaty Three Nation. Um, and they're Ojibwe from sort of Northern Ontario there and, and across the border. And they were very concerned. They have rights to hunt fish and trap in that territory and were very concerned about the declining sturgeon population. So that's a very <laughs> traditional important fish in that area. And so they were put forward the idea of um, and worked with hydropower interests and state and provincial and local governments who all sit on part of this board, put forward a research project to assess it, are there better ways we could manage hydro flows based on what their traditional knowledge is telling them about the spawning locations and times of this very critical fish sturgeon. And they did a research project and they agreed by consensus to alter the flows at certain times. This was about maybe a decade or more ago that they had this agreement and figured this out. And we've been watching it for a number of years and the sturgeon population is going up. Um, wow. so we're absolutely thrilled to see the positive impact of this. And it was based directly on Western scientific and indigenous knowledge about the region. Which is fantastic. And have you seen anything similar in your work with Native American tribes where they brought a unique knowledge that traditional science may not have thought of? Yes, absolutely. Uh, when I was at the Department of the Interior, one of the um, programs that I participated quite a bit in was um, something called the Glen Canyon Adaptive Management Program, which is Glen Canyon Dam is the dam that creates Lake Powell and it's kind of the um, fulcrum on the Colorado River. And um, it is an important um, operational point for a bunch of endangered fish species that, um, that live downstream of the dam. Um, and 
you know, it's, it's these classic problems in, are uh, created that um, that bring so many things together. But um, because of the existence of the dam, which creates a lot of cold water being released from the dam, whereas the water used to be a lot warmer, um, great place to have a trout fishery. Um, and so the Arizona Fish and Game Department and the US Fish and Wildlife Service stocked trout below the dam. Trout loved it, um, but mm -hmm. the trout are uh, predators on the native fish. Um, and so then what do you do? Well, um, game and fish divisions traditionally use electroshocking to control fish populations. But this was happening in the Grand Canyon. And the Grand Canyon is a sacred place for many Southwestern Native American tribes. And the taking of life in that sacred place, even if it was non-Native fish, was anathema to some of the tribes. And so we had to work out a way that the, the trout as predators could be controlled um, and uh, allow the endangered fish to thrive, um, but in a way that wasn't offensive um, to the cultural values. And the traditional ecological knowledge of the elders in the tribes that were um, directly adjacent to this part of the Colorado River was, um, it proved to be absolutely right um, even though it was initially perceived as um, directly opposite from Western science. Real lesson in um, listening carefully to that kind of traditional knowledge. Absolutely. It, it also plays to this concept um, when we think about transboundary issues of the complexity, right? So the different layers of of jurisdictions and Gilbert, you're in the ground, you know, on the ground working in these complex relationships and, and trying to meet the needs of your own community and the region as a whole. So talk a little bit about those relationships and navigating that and how difficult that can be. Yeah, it's, it's um, it, it can be challenging. You know, we have uh, not only, you know, it starts with our relationship with TCEQ you know, then our relationship with, with, with EPA, right? That's For those of oh, EQ, that's the Texas. <laughs> yeah, that's our Texas Commission. That's our Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. So that's our regulatory commission in the state of Texas. Um, they, you know, they are charged with uh, implementing, you know, you know, very basically the, you know, the, the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act from the EPA. Uh, so then there's our relationship with, with the EPA at, a, at the federal level as well. Uh, but then there's our relationships here here locally, which I'll consider um, uh, the IBWC as a local relationship for us, although they're a federal um, uh, agency. They are based out of El Paso, Texas, so that's an agency that we speak with and interact with uh, quite a bit. Uh, not on the water production side of it, but actually uh, on the stormwater side of it, which is something that I, I, I didn't mention in my presentation, but the, the, the stormwater utility and stormwater management in El Paso is something that we in, that we are uh, responsible for as well. So river levees, um, river uh, discharges, discharges of stormwater into the river, water quality um, associated with that. That's something that we deal with IBWC uh, quite a bit and the local uh, irrigation community as well. Uh, and then you throw on top of that our relationship with uh, Hamas, which is the Junta Municipal de Aguas y Sanimentos, the water utility in uh, Ciudad Juarez, and the relationship we have with them uh, to ensure that we're both monitoring the groundwater levels in the wakeable zone. That's our biggest interaction with them uh, in the past. It was uh, frankly just very basic in sharing wa water level elevation, elevations with them uh, of certain wells. Uh, but as the relationship has grown, you know, we've used uh, the IBWC and their con counterpart uh, agency in Mexico, SILA, uh, to be able to uh, be able to share. They're the mechanism for us to share information with Mexico. Um, and at this point, it's grown to about the maximum point where we are fully sharing our groundwater uh, data with uh, Mexico on the Waco Bolson. Uh, and, and, and they are reciprocating sharing uh, the groundwater data with, with, with us. And in 2016, we were both able to complete a full groundwater model 
uh, complete across the international border of the Waco Bull Zone. Um, we are using the same software to avoid any type of, of issues. You know, we're both using a, a mod flow based a model. Um, and most recently we provided to them uh, the water quality. So we've added a water quality component to our groundwater model, which we shared with them, uh, which they found very interesting and, and frankly fascinating because that's something that they were also planning on doing. We shared it with them. Uh, our counterparts in Juarez said, hey, you know, we're actually planning on doing that ourselves. So when we showed it to them, uh, provided the data to them, uh, we probably saved them a couple of uh, years on some of the pitfalls and, and we were, you know, again, we're more than happy to show this information for them. So again, in 2016, it was just a huge uh, achievement to be able to complete a, com to have a complete model of the Waco Bull Zone across the international border. Yeah, that's awesome. I wonder uh, which of our other basins have that cross-boundary model and how well that works. I don't know, Marilyn or, or Anne, if you have a comment on that with your transboundary. Um, I know that the U.S. Geological Survey has been working on creating a tr uh, transboundary model of the Rio Grande um, and, and the connected groundwater. Um, and it's, it's just a huge project. So Gilbert, yeah. it's amazing that you and Hamas have been able to put that together and, and share it. And, and certainly the USGS played a big role in, in, in everything that I just described as well. Marilyn, how about on the Canadian border? Is that something you guys are looking at? On the, the Western side from sort of central Canada West, very little is, we have much science that we do, but integrated modeling is more specific to uh, specific sections. The Great Lakes though, a lot of work being done on that, on an early warning system and integrated system and, and that kind of a thing. But yeah, it's just, it's just such a massive complex system that um, I think they've been working on it forever and they'll continue to. <laughs> um, so that's amazing work that you've been able to do, Gilbert. And uh, yeah. yeah it, it really speaks to El Paso's progressiveness as a utility, have always been on the cutting edge. That just is another example of, of some great work. Um, along those lines of Gilbert talking about the, the relationships among jurisdictions, one of our viewers asked, what are the roles of different stakeholders such as the national government, local government, civic society, academics, and communities in, in transboundary trans water management between US and Canada? And are there examples on the Colorado River? So commissioner, we'll start with you, um, just talking about different stakeholders and, and who's at the table and those yes. roles. So as I said, we when we do any work we do, we go out and, and meet with many people, all, for example, all the way through studies, we're constantly engaging. Um, we are increasing our outreach efforts uh, uh, as of late because climate change is making um, disinformation or misunderstandings more frequent, we find. So we have to do a lot, of, a lot more outreach than we did in the past. However, that's just our general work. Um, uh, we, we are built on the boards, the 18 boards, 16 to 18 boards that we have are all comprised of volunteers who are permanent, who are members for like three years, whatever amount of time. And they're, they are representative of local governments, uh, sometimes federal government, um, indigenous governments, academia. It's, it's who, they can be appointed by any number of possible mechanisms. Um, and if they've got the qualifications and the interest, they can participate on our board. And they, our boards are phenomenally dedicated and very, um, it's just, we, we would be virtually nowhere with, without them. So yeah, they, the boards are a critical mechanism of involving many sectors of society in addition to the general outreach we do. The reason I brought up indigenous engagement is because traditionally indigenous people have not participated very much in those mechanisms. One of our commissioners now, Henry Lickers, is a long-standing participant in IJC um, activities because his community, his nation is situated right in the middle of the St. Lawrence River, which is the big Eastern seaway that separates Canada and the US. And so he's lived the significance of the IJC to his nation. Um, but in, in general, Indigenous 
uh, folks have struggled to either have the capacity, find the funding, or see the direct relevance to their lives of the work that we do. So that's why we are working very hard on that front. Great. And how about in the Colorado River? Any similarities or different approach? Well, um, some similarities, some differences. Uh, so I, I referred to a couple of the recent minutes uh, agreements between the US and Mexico for operation of the Colorado River. And um, the two most recent um, deal with sort of three legs of the stool. Um, one is water operations management and what we're gonna do if water is short. Um, in, and there, it provides for um, uh, reductions in deliveries, not just US to Mexico, but among the US states. And of course, state governments were very much involved, key players in those negotiations, as were some of the major uh, municipal and agricultural diverters along the lower reaches of the Colorado River. Um, the Mexican states, not so much involved uh, because they have more of a federal water structure. So, um, but the US states were heavily involved. So one prong, operations um, management, uh, sort of traditional water quantity stuff. Another prong, joint infrastructure projects. That tended to be between um, irrigation interests in Mexico and large municipal diverters in the US. So an interesting cross-border combination. And the third prong or third leg of the stool um, was environmental stewardship. And in that component, environmental NGOs on both sides of the border were heavily involved. Um, they were written into this agreement, which is part of a treaty. Um, and it's really unusual to see environmental um, interests specifically called out in um, this type of international agreement. And they provided some of the money that was required to make the environmental cooperation happen. So um, it, it was, those agreements were a, a really interesting demonstration of the impact of environmental NGOs. And, and so the, the sector that I have not mentioned is tribes. And they in historically have tended not to be significantly involved in these operational discussions. That is changing. Um, and one of the groups that I'm involved in now is fully focused on elevating tribal voices in exactly these types of discussions. And there's a new component there um, that as Merrill Ann said, there's lots of different interests different types of governance structures. It's not an easy process, but it's one that I think the US players are very committed to. Yes, definitely essential to the conversation. Um, uh, Gilbert highlighted a great example of reuse projects in the US, which are part of the US utilities plan for resilient water supplies. Um, Marilyn, are there examples of reuse in Canada along the border to address these kinds of issues, or is that an area that's not really being explored that much? So I might, I don't know the answer to that question, but I can say that I was very surprised by Gilbert's slide at the amount, because it's the fact that I don't know for sure the question shows that it's not big, yeah. it's, right? Um, if, it, if it was significant, I would be aware of it. And so I, I apologize if there's some place along the Canada-US border that it's being used, but it's not a front of my mind. So I, I mean, I was just super surprised by your uh, graph and your current and projected shifting in use and the costs associated with that, amazing. And very different situations yes. uh, between uh, the two borders, hey? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think that that plays to an arid region versus a water rich region, right? Um, but I think as we know, water flows downhill, the more, um, the more interesting and diverse projects that we can do to address water quality and water quantity going downstream is a good thing. So yes, we'll, uh, we'll continue to work with our Canadian partners on reuse. 
<laughs> and we're not necessarily all the way along our border. We're not necessarily upstream or downstream. We keep switching spots depending on where you are on the border, right? And mm -hmm. and what we're facing now is we have a, a, what we're seeing characterized is extreme flooding and extreme drought, much more difficult than we did in the past. And so it's pushing us to consider these kinds of situations, but we don't have a desalinization, for example, option in the middle of the country or things like that. We've got to figure out different ways to, to do this, um, to meet these, these very, very arid conditions coming. The projections on climate change for our central part of our country are dire indeed, so. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And that's interesting because one of the items that you brought up when you were talking is this alerting function. Um, and Gilbert hit on, you know, the utilities, which generally work in these kind of timeframes, the 50 year plan, um, you know, the, the, along with Colorado Basin, same, same kind of, you know, we know what our water needs are, but as a system thinking about future total water management, I think is, is an interesting discussion. So um, I'm not sure if thinking long term and are there some things along the Colorado Basin? I mean, great example of minimum flows going into Mexico. Is there a long term vision around that? Um, are there things like reuse that can be implemented to help push those concepts of, of long term along? Yeah, well, um, it, as Gilbert knows well, the Colorado River Basin and the Rio Grande are kind of ground zero for climate change impacts on water um, in the US and um, rising temperature, decreased runoff, um, we're seeing dramatically lower flows and the projections are worse. Um, and so municipal provi providers in particular are very focused on reuse um, and the regulation is a little chaotic. It's state by state um, about how reuse can be done and what it can, what reused water can be used for. Um, but the, the cross border application that I think is the most prominent, most interesting is the possibility for US interests funding desalination plants on the west coast of Mexico and in exchange for that funding and the ability of those Mexican cities to reduce their use, the US would um, deliver less water across the border. So it would be an exchange of funding for water in, in the largest sense. Um, one of those has been proposed for years. There's, as, as everyone knows, there are real issues with the waste stream from desalination plants and environmental issues in general. Um, and uh, partly as a result of that, partly because the, the numbers weren't penciling out, um, the, the plant that is, has been talked about the most, which would be located in Rosarito Beach in Baja California, um, it has not materialized. It's gotten really close to the start of construction, but um, no dice. Uh, but I can see that kind of thing um, continuing to be discussed and ultimately implemented. Yeah, great example. And I, it, go, it takes me back to what Gilbert was talking about with companies on both sides of the border sort of cooperating with each other. Gilbert, you talked about future infrastructure funding and how that's a challenge. Um, you know, do you see those companies and their water security being part of that discussion? So does your stakeholder list include those companies as well? I, I, so it does, it does on, so these are American companies on, you know, located on the Mexican side, you know, where they have their manufacturing uh, facilities. Um, and I think one of the, one of the advantages I would say that, that Mexico has over we do is the ability to do public private partnerships. So this is something that we do see in, in the United States and, and utilities like ours are getting familiar with them, but still we're still in the dipping our toe in the water phase where in Mexico, they've gone all in. So private investment into local water supplies and into projects is certainly something that they rely on again, because they, they don't have the federal funding programs that we do uh, here. They don't have uh, such a, such strong customer, um, uh, 
base you know rates to be able to fund a lot of their infrastructure and and in mexico they they face all the same issues we have you know we we're talking about new water supply and, and new projects but you know one of the biggest issues that they have that we have in the united states is just aging infrastructure and they're trying right. to figure out how to fund their aging infrastructure so a lot of their resources that is allocated to them from the federal from the mexican federal government is is going towards that which is really spawning a whole lot more uh, innovation um, in the sense of, of different types of public private partnerships. So without a doubt, uh, the manufacturing sector, these American companies located in, in Mexico that understand the synergies between both uh, are, are, are starting to, you know, I can't, there, there isn't one major initiative that, that has been done, but, uh, you know, you know, we, we are approached by folks, would you guys consider this, would you consider that? I think on our side it would be more difficult to do than on the Mexican side, but you know, this is certainly a way to fund projects uh, that benefit both communities. Great. We have a, a question from the audience to Commissioner Farr. Uh, what are your plans? Uh, you, you mentioned climate change a few times in this, uh, again, alerting function. Um, you mentioned that the central area is really gonna be more, much more arid. Um, so what are the future plans? How are you approaching sort of this climate change and water quality challenges in the future? Well, we have so many ways that we're trying to tackle it. Um, I mean, we have a general adaptive approach where we're adaptive management, just trying to test new things and see what works and change accordingly. We have, we're going to have, the predictions are drastic extremes. So we're going to have a lot of flooding and a lot of drought. Like Manitoba, the province I live in, just a couple of years ago, we had a devastating drought and a devastating flood in the same year, billions of dollars of damage. Um, so it's this crazy extreme. And we see that all along the border. The Great Lakes have had just record high levels for years now. And it's just extremely challenging to, uh, to deal with because we can't change what's happening, you know, mother nature, we can't change the amount of inflows that are coming into the system on spring runoff, for example. All we can do is manage our, the, the, the structures that we have some authority over, we can manage those to the greatest extent possible, um, like open the gates full up and let everything out as much as we can, and that's the most we can do. And so there's some limits to what we can do, you see, but, um, Great, great limits. But I what we're really trying to do is go back and we're considering, for example, um, the need to look at all of the orders. Many of the orders that we have, have are older and were done at a time prior to really obvious impacts of climate change. And so we've got to look at them all and reassess their resilience in the face of climate change? Are they as creative and fine-tuned as they need to be? The individuals that are managing all the control boards and all the water boards are amazing and incredibly dedicated and work so well together and do the best they can. But I, you know, we're, we're starting to do a full, kind of like a climate assessment all the way along the boards and have been, not just starting, we've been doing it for a while. What we're trying to do is figure out what does this mean for on the ground decisions? Because we've got, as I said, many boards, many decisions. So um, that's, and, and trying to strengthen um, partnerships on science and traditional knowledge in particular to, to get just better information as, as quickly as we can. Uh, agreed, extremely complex issues. Um, and you talked a little bit about environmental pulse flows, um, showed us some great pictures. Um, which I had seen an article about it, but didn't see any pictures. So that was exciting. Um, Bill asks about specifically about um, the pulse releases and if the uh, positive results or the response from that was enough to try it again. So that's my part A of the question. Um, and the second part is you also mentioned when you were talking not just about the the pulse release, but this concept of joint shortage sharing. So if you can just touch on that real quick. You got um, So the pulse flow that was provided for in one of the agreements between the US and Mexico was intended to be a one-time thing, possibly repeatable in the next set of agreements. But, uh, and, and that pulse flow was timed to mimic 
the um, what would normally be a spring flood. Um, and the idea was that it could, um, it, it was timed at the time cottonwoods and willows were dispersing their seeds and it could wet those seeds in the ground and they would germinate and the roots would follow the water table down as the pulse flow receded um, and, and reestablish the riparian vegetation. Uh, that didn't work as well as we could have wished. Um, it worked in areas that were already subject to restoration and had been tilled and um, planted. Didn't work so well in the rest of the river. And the scientific determination seemed to be that base flows would be more important than periodic pulse flows, keeping a minimum level of base flow in the river so that there would be a continuous connection between the river and the sea. And the various environmental NGOs have been working for a decade now to raise the money and acquire the water that would be necessary to provide that base flow. So stay tuned, um, watch this space and we'll see what happens there. With respect to shortage sharing, that is such an important component of the binational management and management of the Colorado River within the US. And so if you don't mind, I'm gonna um, share my screen again, just to show you one slide um, that uh, illustrates what the shortage sharing looks like. So um, this is a busy slide. The numbers aren't terrifically important here, but um, across the top, you will see the, um, the three states in um, the US in the lower Colorado River Basin Mexico over here toward the right. Um, USBR means the uh, US Bureau of Reclamation, the operator of the big water projects on the system. And these numbers in the rows and columns are the amount of reduction in delivery that each of these named entities will take when Lake Mead elevations reach these levels. Now these are low levels of elevation in Lake Mead, um, starting at elevation 1090, this is elevation above sea level, um, going down to 1025. Lake Mead is like 30 to 40% full at these levels. And so the idea is that Lake Mead being the largest storage reservoir in the United States, 25 million acre feet, 30 some thousand gigaliters. Um, that as that as the storage in that reservoir declines, that is indicative of dry conditions and less water savings available. And so the states and Mexico are going to reduce their deliveries based on those conditions. And you can see that as Lake Mead gets lower in elevation, less water in storage, the delivery reductions increase. Um, and so Mexico has agreed to share shortage like this with the US. Um, and uh, that agreement is in effect until um, the end of 2025. And now the US states and the two countries are starting to think about what the next version of that agreement will look like with the anticipation that climate change is going to cause even further reduction in flows. And so the cuts will need to go deeper. Great, um, a great concept too. Um, just, you know, everyone sharing a little adversity and understanding for the greater good of the system. It, it furthers those partnerships as well. Yeah, and let me just follow that up by saying, this is relatively unique in, um, in uh, just one country's river basin and certainly in a binational um, situation. This kind of shortage sharing um, does not exist in connection with the treaty between the US and Mexico on the Rio Grande. And that is causing significant strife right now downstream from Gilbert. Um, and it, it's the kind of thing that uh, with greater cooperation between the two countries on that issue could maybe um, reach a better outcome. Excellent point. 
Gilbert, I would be uh, remiss to not talk about technology innovation, my passion. Um, you mentioned it a few times in your talk, um, but you also talked about water conservation. And I think uh, you even mentioned it was the low hanging fruit that's already taken on water conservation side. Do you see technology playing a role in that? And is water conservation a strong component of your sort of port water supply portfolio going forward? You know, when I think about implementing technologies and water conservation, you know, we've had a lot of discussion about how we're going to reach the 118 gallons per person per day. Lots of different uh, models that we looked at, you know, just different ways to get there. And, you know, it all goes down to one thing. The more you make people's water bills expensive, the less water they're going to use. And technology is certainly tied to that. You know, you saw on the graph the advanced water purification facility you know, in order to um, get a project like that permitted and to gain the confidence of our customer base to uh, to drink this water and, and to uh, frankly believe us that it's safe drinking water, we, we treat it a lot, you know, using ultraviolet light uh, with advanced oxidation uh, is expensive. Uh, the intensity of the UV lights, can, and that's very power intensive. On top of that, you have reverse osmosis uh, membranes to further treat the water as well. Um, and that makes for an expensive water. And, and that's frankly how um, a, a way that technology is going to help with conservation is uh, the increased cost of water. Um, you know, aside from that, you know, you have, uh, you know, we have this groundwater importation project as well. That's a basic pumping project. But, you know, I think the importance with technology moving forward is that it's proven and it ne you need to have the, the trust of the customers uh, in the technologies that you're using. Um, and certainly in a project like the one we're doing in El Paso, uh, UV, ultra, you know, UV, um, reverse osmosis, granular activated carbon, th these are, are proven water treatment, um, uh, water treatment uh, uh, technologies that we're using. So that, that, that's, that's a way to get, to gain the customer's uh, confidence. I think from a, from a reuse standpoint, you know, water reuse, you know, there's, depending on what part of the country you are, you know, they're facing different challenges, you know, in El Paso, even in our wastewater, it, it's removing salts, uh, but, you know, UV and uh, reverse osmosis and now ozone and granular ac activated carbon is showing to remove a lot of the contaminants of concern uh, mm -hmm. that, that uh, communities are concerned with when it comes to UV. Um, and I think, at, at, you know, then you have the, the PFAS um, uh, issue as well as when it comes to, to, you, to water reuse. Um, technology is going to play definitely a role moving forward. Uh, it's it, most of the time it is power intensive. Um, there's a lot of belt and suspenders when it comes to those treatment systems. Again, all in the name of gaining the customer's trust uh, in in a reuse system in a reuse project. And again, tied again to conservation, that just makes the cost of the water more more expensive. Absolutely. We had uh, to go from technology to natural systems infrastructure. So there was a question that was posed, um, if anyone has looked at natural infrastructure, for example, tree canopies as a way to conserve water and look at water quality improvements and those kinds of things, um, or does it end up drawing more water? So just that concept of has anyone, it, it, we know reuse, we know some of the other uh, technology-based treatments, but are there other and more natural things that we can also be doing? And I'll pose that up to all three of you. Well, I, I'll speak just on, from the knowledge that I have. We, um, in Canada, there's a huge drive for what's called natural infrastructure. We have large funds that are available federally for local communities and municipalities and regions and indigenous people to do natural infrastructure projects. So that's nature-based solutions in essence to solve a whole bunch of problems. It's called co-benefits and um, there's a, big drive for that. Um, one of the ones that's really relevant to the area I live in is in one of my other hats as a outside of the IJC is trying to determine is there a way that natural infrastructure could deal with what is a massive and very terrible nutrient loading problem we have coming into the Red River on both the US and the Canadian side that leads and, and ends up depositing into Lake Winnipeg and then out into the Hudson Bay. And it's, it's killing our lake, frankly. And it's a, we have a, the 11th largest lake in the world 
uh, Lake Winnipeg. And so it's a massive, massive problem. And natural infrastructure, because of its climate change, greenhouse gas, habitat, flood and drought retention, all of the co-benefits is really significant for us right now. And to try to, um, I, IJC, I believe, was interested in looking at how that could be part of the, part of our climate change strategy is focusing on resilience. We just have to start thinking way further down the path in terms of changing the way we do things instead of kind of tinkering at the edges and trying to just adapt in real time, which is part of what we have to do. But resilience means things like, and this is where we have a difficult time because we're not a government, we can't, we're not the builders, but you know, um, continuing to build in floodplains when you have drastic flood cycles that are happening now is a strategy that is not a strategy for long-term success. We need to work with, we need local governments to change the bylaws, for example, on those things to make it much more difficult or to prevent it. And, and so, you know, this, and that's a resilient strategy. That's a long-term change that's needed. And so, that's, you know, we're, we're looking at alternatives like that. And I think natural infrastructure is such a potentially important uh, player in that. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up building in the floodplain, Maryland, because I think that's, um, it's so important for uh, so many areas of the country. And we see it play out year after year with hurricanes and flooding. And, um, the only other thing I'll mention in, in it, may or may not be green infrastructure depending on your point of view, but in the Southwest, uh, Southwestern US, where evaporation from storage reservoirs is such a huge deal, uh, aquifer storage and recovery is increasingly um, being investigated. Uh, there, there are issues there, you know, it's not, that's why I say it may or may not be green, um, but it, it, and certainly building new reservoirs is like not a very great environmental solution. Um, but uh, water quality issues, um, what are you doing to the aquifer, all that kind of stuff has to be um, investigated and, and more scientifically proven, I think, for aquifer storage and recovery. But that is an area of um, future growth, I would say. Um, as a different way of thinking about water systems. Melissa, if I could just add to that real quickly, wetlands. So certainly in, in the use of wetlands for improving water quality, either for aquifer storage um, or, or for any other means, again, it's, it's a great way. And I think it's very much underutilized, the use of wetlands. Uh, so many advantages, not only for uh, for improving the water quality, but for the environment too, to restore riparian habitat. So I, I think wetlands is, is certainly an area of growth that, that, that we should see uh, overall. Excellent, excellent. Okay, we are out of time, but I wanna give you one more question, just a quick fire drill, if you will, in closing thoughts. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, transboundary water management is influenced by water availability, management and use within each country. Our top examples, give me your top example of water management approaches either that you're personally familiar with or that you've heard of or that you think we should try that can improve our transboundary relationships. Gilbert, I'll start with you. Well, you know, Melissa, I'll, I'll go back to what we've already done here, here in El Paso with Ciudad Juarez is again, the free, free, for as much as it can be, the free flowing of information between uh, between two countries. It, it goes back to the data, you know, they're making decisions on future water supply and how to meet their demand uh, based on, on data. And the better their data, the better decisions they can make, same for us as well. Um, so for me, just data just is, is driving decisions, good data that's not politicized. And certainly that's one of the things that we're um, enjoying here in El Paso is that this is, you've got technical folks talking to technical folks, talking nothing but water and data and good decisions are being made because of that. Excellent point. Anne? Um, just big picture, I would say managing a river system as a river system and optimizing that management, not thinking about borders. 
Um, that can be politically very hard to do, but I do think that water has traditionally been more nonpartisan than a lot of other transboundary issues. And so if we can um, get all the good scientific and technical minds together and figure out how to optimize usage without thinking about borders, we'll have a better system. Here, here. Marilyn. And can I just say ditto and ditto? They've <laughs> excellent comments. <laughs> I totally agree with both of them. Um, and so I'll just put uh, a spin on this, which is uh, the human spin, the governance spin on this. You, when you think about um, operating and thinking about it like an ecosystem, as Anne just said, the thinking, um, getting out of our silos and our competitions and our turf and coming together and figuring out what are alternative mechanisms, tables, governance situations that we can create to allow for the conversation to happen. For allow for con and, and it means alternative ways for decision makers to think about how they can make decisions. Can we come together some way differently with different players? Who are the ones that need to be here to make this happen? That I call this in Canada collaborative governance. It's it's what we put forward to bring Indigenous people to the table, but others that are excluded, and lots are. So I would, it's like the ecosystem of people also necessary. Absolutely. Thank you very much to our panelists. I think that the conversation was fantastic. I appreciate you participating and actively participating. I hope the audience got something out of this. Um, I'm sure, hopefully, I, I did at least. So again, thank you very much for for participating today. Uh, your knowledge and experience is something to look up to and we appreciate your commitment um, to your communities and, and your, um, you know, for the future of water. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa. Marilyn. And thank Marilyn, you to the care. other panelists for amazing stories. Thank you. Yes. Same here. Oh, thank you all. Bye.